welcome to the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center's An Afternoon with the Author, where we invite authors from across the state and nation to come on and talk to us a little bit more about the backstory to their work. Good afternoon. My name is Deidre Teagarden. I'm the executive director here at the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center on Maui, where our mission is to inspire people to find the hero within themselves through the legacy of our Nisei veterans. You can find out more information about our center on the web at nvmc.org. We are so thrilled to have all of you join us today for this uh, very interesting talk with Naomi Hirahara. And uh, before I introduce her, I just want to say to all of our friends from Japan, Honjitsuwa o isogashi naka go sanka kudasari makoto ni arigato gozaimasu. Um, as always, we love to take your questions, so feel free to type them in that little question and answer box at the bottom left of your screen, and we will get to as many as possible. Uh, Naomi also said she loves to answer questions, so keep them coming and just type them in as you think of them. And uh, again, promise to get to as many as possible. This is being recorded and will be available on our Nisei Veterans Memorial Center YouTube channel in about a week. Uh, we encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and check out this and other talks that you may have missed. And of course, we couldn't do this programming or any of the programming we do here at the center if it weren't for generous supporters such as yourselves and of course our corporate sponsors. You saw their logos as you joined the call today. Um, so please help me, mahalo then. Uh, now without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Naomi Hirahara is an Edgar Award-winning author of multiple traditional mystery series and noir short stories. Her Mas Arai mysteries, which have been published in Japanese, Korean, and French, feature a Los Angeles gardener and a Hiroshima survivor who solves crimes. The seventh and final Mas Arai mystery is Hiroshima Boy, which was nominated for an Edgar Award for Best Paperback Original. The book that we're talking about today, her first historical mystery, is Clark and Division, which follows a Japanese-American family's move to Chicago in 1944 after being released from the California Wartime Detention Center. Her second Leilani Santiago Hawaii mystery, An Eternal Lay, is scheduled to be released in 2022. Naomi was a reporter and editor of the Rafu Shimpo during the culmination of the redress and reparations movement for Japanese Americans who were forcibly removed from their homes during World War II. And during her tenure as editor, the newspaper published a highly acclaimed inter-ethnic relations series after the LA riots. Naomi received her bachelor's degree in international relations from Stanford University and studied at the Inter-University Center for Advanced Japanese Language Studies in Tokyo. She also spent three months as a volunteer work camper in Ghana, West Africa. Naomi and her husband, Wes, make their home in Southern California. Um, please help me give a very warm Maui virtual welcome to Naomi Hirahara. Naomi, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Deidre. And thanks to the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center for having me. I wish I could be with you all in person, especially in Hawaii. But, you know, we have to be safe. So here I am in Pasadena, California. Well, we're so glad you you zoomed in to be with us. And as soon as we reopen uh, as a as a community, you definitely have to come out here and we'll do something in person. Great. Okay. Looking forward. Uh, good. So, you know, I, we, we, we're, I, we want to talk, of course, about um, Clark and Division, but before we do that, just kind of wanted to get a little bit more of a background history of you and your family, you know, so I thought um, maybe you could just kind of talk a little bit about your family, your connection with um, Hiroshima, uh, connection with internment, just to give us a background. Okay, I'm going to share, I, I just find, especially on this format, it's kind of nice to actually show you photos. So I'm going to share my screen right now and show you some photo, family photos mostly. Um, so this is uh, my father's side. My father's, uh, he passed away in uh, 2000, 
uh, 12, um, but his name was Isamu Hirahara. His nickname was uh, Sam. So keep that in mind when we talk about Maserai, because Sam and Moss, right? There's some, it wasn't intentional. But the photo on your left, my father is a little guy, you know, on the stool. And um, he and his, this is his three older siblings, and they were all born in Watsonville, California. So um, my, and then this photo was taken right before they were all going to go to Hiroshima, which is um, uh, my uh, grandfather and grandmother's home. So essentially, you know, with, with these immigration stories, there's so much jumping around and actually, my great grandfather had been in America, but apparently he got killed by a horse and that caused uh, my father's family to return to Hiroshima. So they were in the countryside. Um, the middle photo is so my father was a very young um, teenager during World War II. Um, so they didn't have, you know, school was suspended for especially the boys. And what they had to do is they had to work you know, in some capacity in some industry. And my father was assigned to the train station. So that's um, his photo right there. And that's where he was when um, the atomic bomb was dropped. So my father is like an American atomic bomb survivor, which I think is kind of interesting in the whole discussion of what happened in Hiroshima. And the photo on the right is him as a gardener. So he worked as a maintenance gardener, did some landscaping too. Um, in Pasadena, California, where I currently live. And just super briefly, this is on the right-hand side is more my mother's story. The, the little guy's my brother, who's one being held my, by my grandmother, my maternal grandmother who was born in Hiroshima. So her husband, my grandfather was in, unfortunately he was in ground zero of Hiroshima. So he died. Um, but so, but my grandmother survived and the woman in the glasses is my mom. So, and this kind of is a snapshot of how our personal life, you know, here's our cousins are, um, my father's other cousins were actually incarcerated in, um, Arkansas during World War II, but our side of the family were the, um, it was either the Kibe Nisei story or they were in Japan, you know, or they just remained in Japan. And the other photos, just like my multi-ethnic, you know, elementary school. And there, there I am as a reporter at the Rafu Shimpo. And I, I do think um, that experience as a reporter um, was really seminal for me in writing my mysteries and just learning more about our, you know, our community's history. Um. Yeah, you know, I, I love the I, I love the the family photos, and it seems that you know, family is really reflected in, in all of your, in all of your books. Um, uh, so that must have just, you know, played such a, such an integral part in, in your writing. Um, you know, I, I read this article that someone had written, uh, did an interview with you, and you mentioned that when you were young, you really acted as an interpreter for your family, not only language wise, but also culture wise. And, and do you feel like that had something to do with you becoming uh, an author? I think certainly like, you know, most writers are observers. And I think if you're in that role of interpreter, you have to kind of, first of all, you need to know your family, the inside, you know, group where they're coming from. But then you have to have this understanding of the outside world. So you're kind of, you know, actually negotiating two worlds. Um, I have one slide I wanted to, I'll show one slide here. Let's see. Um, this one, um, so this just shows a lot of more, my in, kind of the international aspect of my upbringing. So since my mom was from Hiroshima, um, you know, we, I would go regularly as a child, you know, to Hiroshima. And here I'm in this beautiful flower field. This is actually close to where my my father's family lived in Tenno. And there's my mother with, you know, three-year-old me. And that's me later when I was, you mentioned when I was with the Inner University Center. I know I look like 10 years old, but I was actually out of college when I in the photo on the right, you know, in Kamakura. But 
Yeah, I think definitely. Um, and, and probably because of my uh, family's international background too, that got me into, you know, international relations and kind of learning about different cultures and um, just a curi- having a curiosity about that. And, you know, I, I think in that same article, you had mentioned how important it is to have that overseas living experience. Um, can you kind of expand on, on why that's so important? Well, I think there's just certain things you just take for granted. I mean, I went, I was in Japan in the 1980s. Remember the Sento? Yes. <laughs> so, so, so part of my um, living, I did live with my relatives for a short period of time. And then I lived in typical like Japanese housing, like student housing, where, you know, the, the walls literally are paper thin. And my neighbor was turning his, the newspaper pages of his newspaper and I could hear him. And those were the days, you know, you didn't get a phone. It was hard, you know, uh, for a foreigner to get a phone. So It I cost didn't... so much money to get a phone <laughs> in the 1980s in Japan. You're right. Wait, so you were you there at the same, around the same time? Yeah. We were. We were there 80 to like 84. And so, it was, yeah. it, you had to be really wealthy to have a phone. <laughs> so it's, it's, and then, and I didn't have a, bath, a bathtub. So I had to go to the Cento, which was a wonderful communal um, experience. But all of these things, I think, you know, little ways, we just look at the world around us and think, you know, this is how the world is. This is how everybody lives their life. And I just, you know, even just moving from one part of the, the United States to another, you can get that. But certainly, you know, moving to another country um, and, and interacting with people, that's when you kind of learn that you need to open up your thinking um, and not necessarily just impose what you think on other people. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, you, you have to really give such credit to, to your parents, to one's parents and the, the courage that they had to, to move around and um, boy. Yeah, my, basically I'm my mother's, my, my, my well, you know, now she has more blood relatives, but when I was born, I was, you know, really the only blood relative of my mother in this country. So I just, you know, can't imagine, you know, people have a hard time just having babies without, with a lot of support and not to have that, you know, it it was very difficult. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of gum on and, and endurance. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about your different your different character your different protagonists. You have Masarai, and someone has already written in about how much they love and miss Masarai. Um, Leilani Santiago, and then in this book you have Aki Ito. Do you feel like there is a common denominator in their personalities, or is there there's something that you you put in their personalities that you want to like share with the the greater community? Um, you, you seem to make heroes out of like the, these everyday individuals. For sure. I mean, that's what I'm going after. I mean, I did, okay, I went to Stanford and I took this class about the Edo period, um, you know, in terms of the things that were drawn were very simple. Remember, they were trying to uh, throw away any notion of elitism. So you would see sparrows, right, in in these Sumiye paintings. And I think, you know, I'm going after the sparrows of our lives. You know, the people, they seem ubiquitous, they seem everywhere, but um, they're really important. Um, And I think being a reporter, especially for an ethnic newspaper, you know, and I was, I I had to cover like ballroom dancing, you know, I had called not only, you know, very high profile um, uh, events, but just, you know, uh, the 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 optimist club meeting you know which i attended and then every time they said a certain word they had to put a quarter in in a in a container and you know so that was new to me so you know i learned something so i think um you know that's what i'm after and i think in terms of being a japanese american in the states um there's not that much representation of us Um, especially just like current day representation. And I think that's what I do love about the Maserai because it is, it's like a cold case. 
Um, so there is a lot of history that's being dredged up from the past, but it's set in like, you know, the late 20th century, early 21st century. So, you know, you know, Moss is eating burritos and doing, you know, everyday things that we all do. And I kind of, I, I like that series for that mix. You know, and in that series and in, in the, the new book, um, Clark and Division, you, you really make it a point to use Japanese words, Japanese ideas, and not just the, the, the more regular ones that, you know, we might all be familiar with. Um, uh, how important um, is it to you to really share these cultural ideals and the language um, in the book? And, and in the Maserai, there's also, you know, a little pigeon as well. So, like, even the titles, like Summer of the Big Bachi, but I, that is like maybe the fifth title iteration. I think it started out LA Shakes and then it was supposed to be um, the handicapper, which is like a, a horse racing term. And then it was gonna be broken branches. You know, a lot of Asian American literature has like um, things about nature in it. And then when it became summer of the big bachi because Moss talks about bachi in the book like my husband said, oh, that's that's when you got the voice of the book. And I go, that's true. And uh, so I've been influenced by actually some Yiddish writers, um, Kaim Podak, I'm mispronouncing his name. But um, so because I, I was a curious person, always learning, wanting to learn about other cultures. So I know what mensch is. I know, you know, I know these terms of different cultures. And I said, and I started wondering what about these words I hear in America on a regular basis, like big bachi, not big bachi. Well, when mom says, don't do that, you're going to get big bachi, you know, you, you, that, that's a very emotional phrase. And just gasa gasa, you know, you're so gasa gasa. And just all, so I really, you know, thought I want to incorporate that not only in the book, but they're in the title which is kind of crazy, you know, when you think about it. And the first three were published by Random House. So it's like a mainstream publisher. And, and none of the Maserais have um, a glossary. So it's really up to people to learn it in the context. So I just, you know, feel that um, my, my husband's an educator and he tells me like language is emotional and that's why I wanted to incorporate some of these terms, um, because I think it evokes emotion in, um, a, you know, a group of people, you know, it's, it's going to be different with the next generation. And what's really funny is it's different for people in Japan, because when they hear bachi, it's not going to be the same as the bachi we're familiar with. So I've had right. Japanese people say, what? I don't understand. You know? So I, I guess I'm trying, in a way, I'm trying to just capture a time, a place, and a people, you know, and um, I, I just feel that's my job. I can't predict the future, but I, I can know what's happening right in front of me, so... Wow, oh. you know, and I um, I think it's so interesting too, especially in Clark and Division, you use like the word the the idea of kudo, you know, to 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 suffer. But I think it's so hard to translate some of these these ideas into English because even gaman, you know, which everybody re realizes is patience, but you know, it's so much more than that. It's it's this this deep endurance or even okage sama de. But in your book, you're able to to share that in in just a few words. You know, you you say the Japanese word, but then you give these wonderful English explanations, which obviously comes from you're, you're knowing the language so well that you're able to translate it so well. I think some of it too is, I will say this, that there are certain words that Japanese words that Japanese Americans use, but then it starts to have its own meaning over here. And there's also, you know, we're a product of the Meiji period because like, not in my case, but many of my friends, their grandparents came you know, they're, they're Meiji Jidai people. So um, in a way, we're like um, frozen. <laughs> we're frozen in stone because we have some traditional values that 
even people today in Japan do not have. <laughs> and it's just like things like oshogatsu, you know, like in Japan, you just go to the department store and order your food. You're not going to actually try to make it. <laughs> But I think percentage wise, there's more people here trying to actually, you know, make all the osechi ro rori. <laughs> right. Interesting. Um, before we start, talking about the, the, the Clark and division, I do want to say that you have been called the godmother of all Asian American mystery novelists. Um, how does that make you feel? And is that, is that a pressure or is it a compliment well, or is it both? I think you just mentioned that to me recently, which is hilarious. Um, you know, I will say this, um, it, I was, whenever I would go to these mystery conventions, you know, I was like the only, practically the only Asian person there. And many times I would be mistaken for, you know, um, a reader who was like much taller. I'm very small. I'm a Meiji Jedi person. I'm, <laughs> I'm a 4'10". Four, four <laughs> so, um, you know, and there was like a woman, a, a JA woman who was like, I don't know, 5'8", who was a reader. And everyone kept mixing this up and I was going, what? <laughs> But um, I, I feel right now um, there's so many mystery writers of color and so many, we have so many Asian Americans and now um, getting some J Japanese Americans with Scott Kikawa, which makes me really, I'm, I'm delighted because every person can tell a slightly different story and um, no one has to feel responsible. Like I have to tell the great, you know, Japanese American or Asian American story. We, it, you know, the pressure's not there. So, um, um, so it, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's interesting. Uh, that's very interesting. Okay. So let's get to the book. Um, it's marvelous. It's coming out. You can pre-order it. We've been sharing it on our, on our uh, website. Without giving too much away, um, let's talk about the book. And can, can you give us a, the synopsis that, that you would like us to know about the book? Well, Clarkin Division follows a Japanese American family, the Itos, um, from their um, home in, it's a place near downtown LA. It's called, it, the historic name is Tropical. So they go uh, from tropical and then the, it's the, the outbreak of World War II. So they're incarcerated in Manzanar. And from there, the, um, there's two sisters. So it's really a story about the younger sister. It's told in her voice. And she um, idolizes her older sister. And it's her older sister, Rose, who um, is able to leave camp early and goes to Chicago, which was the num number one destination for Japanese Americans being released from camp. So she goes, um, just to give you a sense of the scope, there were 400 Japanese Americans before World War II. By the mid 40s, there were um, 20,000 people. So that was quite substantial. And um, then um, essentially what happens, you know, so the family joins Rose and the, something tragic has happened. So it's really up to the younger sister, Aki, to find out the truth, as well as to kind of carry her parents through a very tumultuous period. So that's kind of the essence of the, the plot. And, um, you know, Aki, I, I love, all, all of the characters are just so, so wonderful. And I have to say the first two paragraphs of the book, when I started reading it, um, the, the, that connection that you lay out between the two sisters is just, you know, it's just beautiful. Um, but, you know, in a way, it seems like Aki was kind of in the shadow of her sister. And by the end of the book, you know, you, you see her mature so much. Um, and uh, I'm going on far too long here, sorry. <laughs> I just love the book. And you, you, put in, you bring in so much into the book. You bring in the racism, uh, the discrimination. Uh, there was this one scene where Aki is finally invited to a friend's house to go swimming and then she can't. Um, And that's just you know a heartbreaking a heartbreaking story. But you're able to bring all of these things in, and and of course it's a Japanese American story. But it seems to 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 
transcend ethnicity. Um, and your characters are so human. Can you can you talk about can you talk about how you've made them so so human? They are not perfect. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting in in that I did um, a bulk of the writing as well as the rewriting during the pandemic, and I think just the sense of being confined in a place, and then, like, I guess what what we're going through this right now is kind of being open, but it's still scary, and I think. Um, in terms of our history, Japanese American history, people will say, okay, they were incarcerated and then they were, you know, and then things just went back to normal. But when you think of us as human beings, how can we just magically go, you know, there's something in between the being released and fully, you know, li living your life, the rest of your life. Um, and, and that's kind of the area that I'm trying to address in Clark and Division. Um, it was mostly young people because they wanted, they released the Nisei first because they had to, you know, answer these questions and get sponsors and all that. So um, I think the average age of uh, people, Nisei in Chicago were, it was like the mid twenties. So there were without adult supervision or parental pressures. So, you know, um, some of them got into trouble. Um, and they also, you know, they're young, they wanted romance, there were so many dances, there were so many things, they're kind of negotiating, right? So, and then if you think about them, they were with, you know, their own people of their own ethnicity, like 10,000 of them, you know, for like a year and a half, and then suddenly they're in a, a big city, the second, Chicago at the time was the second biggest city in the U.S., with a very multi-ethnic um, population, you know, that was very hard, you know, to, to, and, and so people had very different kind of um, reactions to that phenomenon. And that's through the characters, it just organically, you know, se seemed to emerge that each person based on their um, personality and their background would um, either flourish or maybe struggle in that kind of environment. Um, Aki at one point uh, gets a job and, and she, she's working at a library. Um, a lot of other people were working at factories, but did you, did you place her in a library um, because you yourself love books or, you know, um, why, why did she, is she based on somebody? Yeah, that, that was a question that um, an academic had asked me, oh, it's genius that you had her at a library because that's where knowledge is from and, you know, a repository of the past. But I basically um, had her at the Newberry Library, which is a very well-known research library, because um, a friend and someone I really respect, Sue Kunitomi Embry, she was a leader who... Um, what enabled Manzanar to be a national site. She was incarcerated there. Um, she had worked at the Newberry Library. So when I was taking a little tour, and I'll show you, um, I'll share my screen again, so I, I can show you a little bit of, about the research. Oh, we'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is like, you know, a family, and this was taken by the War Relocation Authority, and it just shows a family, they were from Tule Lake and just arrived in this, you know, hostel in Chicago and kind of like looking around trying to understand, you know, and here's some, um, these are um, zoot suitors from LA, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and some of them were kind of troublemakers, you know, in Chicago. And um, so this is where, this is from 2017 and, this is the community historian um, who was so in, you know, helpful in helping me to ground um, Clark and Division with a certain neighborhood. It's called that because it's referring to an intersection or a neighborhood in Chicago. So right, it's kind of some blocks below south of Wrigley Field. And um, in the very early year, uh, years of the quote, Japanese American resettlement, that's where they had a lot of boarding houses and you know people um, squished in little rooms and all that. So he, you know, he has this little Google map and he just, you know, we walked around and um, yeah, so he was super helpful and 
this is the last vestiges, you know, there's, there's a Nisei lounge, but there's no Nisei working there owning that, but there's a place that um, serves kind of like this chop suey um, that's famous in Chicago. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, so that gives you kind of a sense of what, what um, I had to do in terms of the research and what, what, yeah. Chicago looks today. Wow. I will say um, that before I read the book, I was assuming that this was somehow about General Mark Clark and uh, uh, the division um, within the Nisei groups, but indeed it's not. And uh, <laughs> uh, you understand that as soon as you read the book. But so would you give us a little reading? Do you, do you have uh, sure. um, something prepared? We would love to, to hear something. I'm just going to read from the beginning. Um, That's a great place to start. Yeah, OK. Yeah, chapter one. And oh, I'll show uh, while I'm reading to you, I, I want to share this one historic. So you just don't see my big head. <laughs> Rose was always there, even while I was being born. It was a breech birth. The midwife, soaked in her own sweat, as well as some of my mother's, had been struggling for hours and didn't notice my three-year-old sister inching her way to the stained bed. According to the midwife, mom was screaming unrepeatable things in Japanese when Rose, the first one to see an actual body part of mine, yanked my slimy foot good and hard. Ito-san! The midwife's voice cut through the chaos and my father came in to get Rose out of the room. Rose ran. Pop couldn't catch her at first, and when he finally did, he couldn't control her. In a matter of minutes, Rose, undeterred by the blood on my squirming body, returned to embrace me into her fan club. Until the end of her days, and even beyond, my gaze would remain on her. Our first encounter became Ito family lore how I came into the world in our town of Tropical, a name that hardly anyone in Los Angeles knows today. I'll just make it short and yeah. So those photos um, were, of, Tropical was one of the first places in LA where Japanese Americans came to grow strawberries. So um, that's where the um, Ito family, that, that's where their roots are wow. in America. It's, it's beautiful. Um, you know, in the book, I, I forget which character it is, but um, this, this is after, you know, the, the family is out of, of internment. They're, they're living in Chicago. And the, he says, you know, you can be out of internment and the, the bars aren't there anymore and you think you're free, but actually you're not. Um, there are all these other soci, sociological, cultural bars that, that still keep you confined. Um, can you talk about that a, a, a little bit? Um, you know, that was such a good part in the book and just came out of the blue. Yeah, and then I noticed, um, I'm, I'm glancing at some of the questions too, and yeah. someone mentioned my nonfiction book. So I had done a, a nonfiction book with my friend, um, Heather Lindquist, and we uh, co-wrote a book called Life After Manzanar. And that was um, very helpful in, um, understanding the larger context of um, uh, of the quote resettlement period, the di diaspora, and one thing, it, this is what you would hear, like like from folks like in Seabrook. I don't know if you're um, familiar with the New Jersey canning um, factory community of Seabrook. You know, it was a corporate town, and they recruited people from camp, and that and also uh, accounts that we read um, oral histories from people um, who are working for companies in Chicago. They said, yeah, there was a glass ceiling. You could only go that far. I would think with Chicago too, that, you know, it's a very strong labor union, labor town. So that was an issue too, because the, the labor unions, they weren't really informed that all these, you know, people would be coming into Chicago and perhaps, you know, um, taking jobs, you know, the, uh, some people would say, hey, you know, we, we want, those are, should be, go to Americans, but of course the Nisei were Americans, so, um, but there were, you know, there were 
there, there were cases where there was a little bit of friction. Um, and yeah. Um, let's look at some of these other questions. Uh, they are about Moss Arai. Um, have, has there been any news on taking his story to television? You had mentioned something at your last of Roman's book signing. And then uh, Peggy is asking if there's any uh, reconsideration for a Maserai movie. So movie or television, Netflix? Uh, you know what we, the, 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 we attempted, um, there, was, uh, there were uh, two people, filmmakers who were trying to do a feature film. Um, and so I, I was trying to assist them too. Oh boy, it's hard. It's really, I mean, it just kind of participating to launch like a, an independent film, it gives you such an appreciation from, for any kind of completed project. So I will say this, I'm less critical <laughs> of certain movies. I mean, it's so easy for us to see something on TV. It's like, why did they do that? That's, you know, they should have used this actor, or that actor, but actually um, it's because you have that money component. I mean, I love writing books because with books, you're not limited. You don't have to think, well, what's my production budget? You could, you know, you could have it on Mars. You don't have to worry about, you know, any of those kind of monetary constraints. And, um, but it was, yeah, we couldn't get it launched. And um, so it was, but it was, you know, just as well, it's okay, you know, and that one of the directors actually did his own feature film on another topic recently. So I was glad that he was able to do that. But, you know, I have a feeling that something's going to happen. Um, just because Moss is a great character, right? <laughs> He's a great character. And look at all these Netflix or masterpiece, you know, mysteries. You know, there's so many of these amateur sleuths, you know, Rosemary and Time, you know, there's so many and, and people love watching that. And I think that, um, I think people like, you know, Moss is kind of like a amateur Columbo, you know, type thing. And, and right. uh, I think it's, oh, it's a matter of getting the right actor. And um, I know through the course of writing the series, because I had, um, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a actor, he's passed away, but named Mako. Um, he actually was nominated for an, an Oscar for this movie called Sand Pebbles. <gasps> You know, so um, he was a very instrumental with um, East West players. So I actually had mailed him somewhere of the Bibachi and, um, but then it turns out he had esophageal cancer and he mm. died, you know. So there was like, Pat, you know, there's been these actors here and there, but um, I have my, um, I have my eyes on somebody. So he's still young. <laughs> So with, with Moss, you know, you could be 60 years old and be a little young for, for the role. So um, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic that, you know, something may happen in the future. So. Good. Good. Well, we, we're, we're hoping, we're hoping with you. And I, I saw some things she put on Facebook. So let's, okay. let's hope something comes through. Um, Peggy Mizumoto said, in your research, did you find much information on McClurg's um, book, Bindery in Chicago, where her mother had worked yeah. after? I've seen so I'm not that much, but I, I've, I've um, in some oral histories, that's definitely come up. There was also some kind of envelope manufacturing company um you know i in terms of my book i i um centered it more on the candy company that was you know um very large in in chicago but um yeah there's i mean if you imagine twenty thousand people you know came through chicago so of course there's going to be so many people with you know some kind of ties yeah <laughs> uh, Scott Kikawa is saying, hope to see you here in Hawaii oh. soon. Mahalo for all you've done for me. You really are our godmother. Um, he said, how was the Chicago JA food, this chop suey thing? Did it have its own uniquely Midwestern character? And more importantly, was it tasty? Uh, <laughs> I think it's an acquired taste. Um, I think, 
you know, of, of course, air, I'm looking, there's an actual name for it, and I've kind of forgotten it. it it's um, named after the, the Nisei creator. Um, but uh, yeah, um, it, it's basically like um, a type of egg, egg foo young, you know, so yeah, it's kind of like farm food, which makes right. sense, right, in Chicago. Right. And uh and it has a lot of gravy and anything with gravy is good. <laughs> gravy, gravy and noodles. I mean, it's got to be good. <laughs> what was the last part of, I, I forgot to mention one other thing he said. Oh, he, uh, uh, oh, he just said what, yeah, what is good? And was it good? Oh, I know what I wanted to mention. What was interesting with Chicago is a couple things um, because um, the war relocation authority said you cannot three or more JAs should not congregate. Well, that was ridiculous because there's so many people coming through and they need the help of other JAs. But as a result, there was no kind of official uh, Japantown. Although um, I picked up a book called Co uh, Chicago Confidential which was very a racist book, <laughs> but it was interesting. It was actually um, complimentary towards the Nisei veterans, um, but it, it's still called like Japanese American slant-eyed and all this like, you know, or, or I think in the beginning it says, are you looking for a little geisha, you know? So it was like this weird, you know, it had some positives, but a lot of negatives, but they referred to Car the Clark and Division area as little Tokyo, but no one else has ever I've never seen it mentioned as a little Tokyo in any other writing. That book um, was published in 1950. So um, yeah, so that's kind of interesting. But so they do have these, the Buddhist temples came in after World War II. And um, so uh, I did a program at one of the Buddhist temples, but the big thing for them is in June is it's chicken teriyaki time. You know, mm. and they they're just, you know, maybe in Hawaii, it's the, it's the same way, you know, I have the chicken, you know, it's and, but it's blazing heat in Chicago. And, you know, all these sunset guys in their 60s are like turning over the teriyaki chicken. <laughs> you gotta love those 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 customs and, uh, you know, that they continue um, regardless of of the weather. <laughs> but, um, you know, another thing in the book was, you know, even though all these terrible things were happening, the the women would, you know, continually want to go to get their hair done, you know, and it just, it seems that that is also a, you know, a kind of a character in the book is always looking, looking apart, looking like life is going really well. Um, but you, you did put it in a lot. What, what was your reasoning for that? Well, in a lot of these uh, war relocation authority uh, photos, everyone's hair is just immaculate, you know, and I'm so jealous. <laughs> and uh, I, so I just, but I think people, observers could get the wrong idea and look at the, the, those photos and say, oh, look at them, they're fine. They look, you know, like they're handling everything wonderfully. So, um, but I think for a lot of um, the Nisei at the time, it was important for them to um, look proper or look, don't look like a victim or don't look ravaged. So although there are some photographers that were able to permeate that wall and really capture what it was like, like inside those, the walls of the rooms, but in, in, in terms of the, their public self, I think it, it was maybe their way to kind of fight against uh, the manner that they were being portrayed that, you know, give them, um, it gave them probably dignity to, to physically present themselves in a nice way. Yeah. Um, what kind of, of legacy do you want these, these books, um, or your writing to have and, you know, as a journalist, but also as a, as a novelist, what, what do you want to be your legacy? Well, I think that um, I, I, I saw some sort of write-up of me somewhere. This is a while back. They go, this is a writer of the Nisei experience. And I was, at first, you know, it's always hard when you read how people perceive you. And I think another 
a, a Japanese academic said her books are very journalistic. And um, I think both things kind of insulted me <laughs> because I was going, am I just limited? You know, because I, I, I thought maybe, you know, journalism was kind of a dirty derogatory word. But when I, I really started to think about it, I go, no, it makes, you know, be, and, you know, in terms of the journalism side, I was during the pandemic, um, I, I, I did a lot of programs with Michael Connolly. Um, you know, he's behind the Bosch series and which is, you know, he writes a lot of different books, but he is this best-selling, very successful author, but he writes like two books a year. Like he doesn't have to do that. And what's also really important to him because we're talking about the pandemic, it's like, are you going to incorporate the pandemic in your books? And he goes, yeah, because, you know, he tries to capture a certain time and place and that's what's happening right now. And I can totally relate, like actually in the second Leilani Santiago that takes place in Kauai, it's gonna be October, 2020. So it's during the pandemic. So, but it's a little different in that, you know, in a place like Kauai, you don't have a lot of people who've died from it. Mm -hmm. And it's more about the closure that it's confined, you know, it's also looking at tourism and those kind of issues. So it's actually super interesting. But um, so I think as journalists and even tackling things like um, the atomic bombing, which is, you know, part of my family history, you know, I don't see it like, oh, I'm trying to do this uh, political diatribe on that. It's more like this happened, you know, mm -hmm. so I want to write about it. It's part of my personal history. So, so I think, yeah, that's where kind of the journalism part. And I'm very curious. I want to know, I'm not only seeking, okay, this is my, the, my inner soul. It's more, I'm curious about other people and how they fit into, you know, our world. So I, I'm constantly trying to learn new things so I could incorporate in the books. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the journalism, you know, part of me. And the niece say, you know, I think that World War II period, who can, I mean, no one could argue that was, you know, a very um, seminal time in Japanese American history. And we don't know everything yet. You know, there's so many, you know, like not many people know the, you know, the, the Hawaii story, the incarceration story, you know, you, you, you all are just getting the story out. But there's, you know, I think, the more you kind of dig, the more you find out, and which I find really fascinating. So because I'm old enough and I worked at the newspaper when, you know, the Nisei were still in what, their 70s, you know, maybe 60s, 70s. Um, so I had relationships with them and I was able to, you know, know them and their, few, mm. their whole humanity and their humor. You know, I think that's one thing that I have a problem with um, some depictions of like Ise or Nise, you know, as being humorless, <laughs> you know, being very stoic and just the nicknames, you know, they're ridiculous. <laughs> and you have to have a sense of humor to like, you know, deal with those kind of nicknames. So, um, yeah, so that's, I, I think because I kn knew them, you know, that generation is unfortunately, you know, pretty much almost gone away. Yeah. So um, it's kind of like, you know, the Hibakusha experience. Like I wasn't there, but I was a witness to witnesses. So I think I'm like the bridge, you know, bridge. With, the, with the young people, they're, they're fan there's some fantastic writers out there and they're highly creative, you know, and innovative. And they're going to interpret all this stuff, you know, and kind of differently than we do. But it's okay. But I want my, I want my version to be out there, <laughs> right. just to be on the books, and then they can jump off and you know do whatever. But I I think there is something to be said of trying to capture how it was, as you know, much as realistically as possible. Right. You know, but I'm a mystery writer, so I'm entertaining people too. 
Right. Do that. Yeah. Uh, um, we have time for a, a few more questions. I'm going to take the one from Gavin Kelly, who uh, actually is the my brother, of course, <laughs> and worked with you at Rafu Shimpo and really uh, put us together. So thank you, Gavin, for that. He's just asking if you can speak about transitioning from writing for writing for and editing a daily newspaper to making that leap to pursuing your your writing of fiction and nonfiction and you know how was that how did you do that well you know i don't know if gavin knew this but i was like working on some of the some of the big bachi took me through oh we can't hear you can you hear me now yes yeah so uh Oh, just said my internet is unstable. Why? Why? What? <laughs> but um, yeah, so I um, I was I was taking classes at um, UCLA Extension, um, trying to work on uh, the first Maserai book. So I think if you you know have some kind of full time gig, it's nice to start working on the book like don't quit <laughs> and then work on it, you know, work on it while you have that day job. Um, because in some ways it kind of frees you up when you, I think if so much is writing on that first book and you're thinking, oh, you know, I have to make a living off this book, it's a bit scary. So you need to write what you're really passionate about. Um, I think the big change was to suddenly, I mean, I'm pr prepared for the pandemic work-wise because it was a big shock to my system to, you know, have that workplace camaraderie, you know, the water cooler talk and celebrate people's birthdays, be all together, and suddenly to be by myself in my house and writing solo. So I, I guess I was prepared for what we just gone through because, you know, it, it, um, it, it, it is a transition to, to be in more solitary and, um, to be very self-disciplined, right? So you're not going to have other people looking over your shoulder. Um, you're going to, you have to be right. the person, right? Um, and during the pandemic, um, what I've been doing is I do sprints with another person. I don't know if you've heard that or if anyone's heard the Pomodoro method, that's where uh, you, it, it's referring to those tomato timers, but it, it's, under the philosophy that it's you can um, it's good to be focused for 25 minutes and then you let your brain rest you know you start you could talk to your buddy you know I we do it over Twitter believe it or not under DMs like oh. around eight right before eight it's like ready get set go and then we're both working on our manuscripts and then at 825 we check in how are you doing how many words did you do and then five minutes later we go back in and i will say um during this pandemic time where you know it's hard to have a sense of time that to start off my morning kind of doing that um what has been super helpful and it's kind of revved because you could go down a rabbit hole of like looking through the you know reading the news on the oh, internet or whatever definitely yeah oh that's good uh let's see denise taraoka says she really appreciates how you were able to incorporate information on hiroshima the camps racism without the politics um and she says i think that makes people want to continue you know learning um will learn about the painful past were you taught this skill or is it your unique talent taught the skill so of, were you oh, taught yeah. the skill of writing without putting the politics into it or oh. is this just a unique you know what talent? i think it's storytellers you know i think and there's um so much emphasis right now on narrative i think in all businesses because people are realizing that you can't just be ideological because that's not you know that doesn't really move people's hearts. And if you have that same ideology, yeah, you'll be, you know, getting into it, but you'll agree, but everyone else who doesn't agree will not listen to you. But I think if you are able just to tell stories, you know, um, because that's what makes us human. Um, so I think for anybody, I don't think I'm special. I think 
just for anybody, if you can, it, it takes um, vulnerability. I think, I think that's the main thing that people get concerned about what other people will think about their story. And I think that paralyzes people. But if you're able to kind of strip that away and just say, this is who I am and this is what really, what happened to me, um, I think people are, will be receptive to it. But sometimes, you know, people don't want, I don't want to be the first to do that. <laughs> right. I feel like I've had a little bit of a journalism class. <laughs> Journalism 101 and Writing 101. Uh, we are gently coming to the end of our hour, and that's always a sad time for me um, and our viewers. But uh, I'm going to come back to you at the, the end, Naomi, for some closing remarks, some final thoughts. Uh, but to everybody else, we want to thank you for joining us today, for spending an hour of your Saturday afternoon, whether you are here in Japan or on the mainland. We really appreciate that. Um, just to let you know, Naomi, uh, the, the, book is, the book is coming out. You can order it on Amazon through Barnes & Noble. There are a number of places where you can order it. If you're interested in getting a book plate, a signed book plate from Naomi Hirahara, just email me and I will get all that information to her and we will get you your book plates. Um, so let me know. We just want to let you also know that our upcoming speakers include Jody Ching. She will be our August speaker. She has a new book out called Ikigai. Uh, and future speakers include Juliet Kono, Gail Harada, and Marilyn Chase. So we encourage you to go to our website at nvmc.org, sign up for our newsletter so you know all of the happenings here at the center and can sign up for all of these wonderful talks that we continue to have throughout the year. Um, but Naomi, I'm, I'm going to bring it back to you. I just again, want to thank you so much for, for taking your time to speak with us today and for doing all the book plates. Um, I, it's been a pleasure for me and I turn it back over to you. Um, I just want to end on this one last slide to talk about another book that's coming out in August. Let's see, let's go here. Oh, so Hiroshima Boys coming out in Japan. These are my Japanese titles and there's the French one. But and we were, gonna, we were gonna talk about yeah. your the signature on here. Oh yeah, so with Hiroshima Boy, I'm happy because it has my kanji. Uh, whereas the other two um, Masarai books um, have, have my katakana. So this is a kind of change, I guess. I'm still gaijin, but I'm gaijin with a kanji. <laughs> that's, that's big. <laughs> so I'm really thrilled about Hiroshima Boy coming out in Japan. And um, someone had asked about Mas, you know, going to the big screen. And, you know, it, it, it may happen through a, a securitous way. It may happen through Japan more than America. So we'll just see what happens. <laughs> well, definitely keep us posted. I will. I will. And uh, when you are ready to launch the next Leilani Santiago book, maybe a, a book signing over here in Hawaii and specifically on Maui would be fantastic. Even though I know it's on Kauai, it's a Kauai based book, but yeah. All right. Um, thank you again so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. And we are all huge fans of your work and everybody needs to go out and order Clark and Division. You will, you will love it. And then it has, I have to show you that I just got the hardcover this week, but it has, so we have end papers with a map of Chicago too. And I'm, I'm just, yeah, so happy. So this is, yeah. So yeah, stay tuned. There's going to be um, a profile in the LA Times. So yeah, I was recently interviewed. And actually, this will, I think this may be my first New York Times. I don't know if it's a good, a good review or a bad review, but apparently New York Times will, will be doing a review. So whatever it is, if it sells books, I'm all for it. <laughs> Well, that's that's marvelous. And I'm sure it's going to be a great review because um, this book can't get any review but a great review. And oh, we okay. is there any future for Aki? Oh, oh yeah, I'm working on a, a follow up. It's called Evergreen. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to say too much about it. <laughs> no. 
Um, okay. Thank you again, Thank everybody. You everybody. Have a wonderful week. Ahui ho. Bye-bye, everybody.